Our guests today are Amherst Town Manager, Paul Balkelman, Amherst Regional Public School Superintendent, Dr. Mike Morris, and Amherst Director of Public Health, Julie Fetterman. Um, she is joining us by phone, so you can't see her at the moment, but um, so starting us off with some important updates is our Town Manager, Paul Balkelman. Thanks, Brianna, and um, thanks for helping to organize all this. <laughs> so, um, so we're living in a Zoom world, and whether we like it or not, and this is where we are. And for all those who are, this is the first time you've connected uh, to Zoom, congratulations for getting through the gauntlet and making it happen. Um, we seem to be, uh, Julie and Mike and Brianna and I seem to be living our lives on this or Teams or some other platform like that. Um, one of the things I first want to talk about is how, um, how well our staff is doing. Um, just um, these are really different circumstances and every member of our staff has really adjusted, taken on new tasks, uh, you know, changed their work habits and just stepped up in a million different ways. And uh, I just wanna especially appreciate uh, all the staff in Town Hall and uh, uh, Bank Center, LSSE, everywhere. Uh, everybody's taken on doing their best they can to make sure the town continues to run, which is our commitment to you as residents of the town. Um, this, I think the, this crisis will actually be, uh, provide some major changes to the way we do business. We're learning a lot about things that we can do differently and better. And we're really excited about that going down the road, which is a long down, time down the road, but we're at the beginning stages of this. We think that the, this curve is just beginning to accelerate. It's going to go up. The governor today talked about the peak being between April 10th and April 20th. That's when the hospitals are most likely to be overloaded. Uh, that's why it's super important right now to be so, to social, uh, physically distance yourself. We don't want to be socially di distanced. Julie keeps correcting me on that. We want to be physically distant from each other, but socially close to each other um, so that we can flatten that curve so our hospitals don't get overwhelmed. It's in our own best interest. It's in our parents and children's best interest. It's in our friends and family's best interest. Um, if you come downtown, you see a lot, you know, the streets are kind of empty and the parking lots, plenty of parking downtown, and, um, but it's really kind of depressing a lot to be down here. But I keep thinking to myself, that's a sign of love. That's a sign of people doing what's necessary to keep the community healthy. The more we can be apart and be away from each other, the less this disease will spread. It can only spread from human to human. If we separate ourselves, it won't be able to spread. So um, I think that this is a, a, a real moment. It's, it's gonna be a few weeks before, before we hit the top and I think that it's gonna be a really trying time because we feel like we've already done, you know, a couple of weeks this, of, of being stuck in our homes, but um, it's gonna be a few more weeks and these are gonna be much harder. So um, my sister was telling me that uh, we were talking on a family thing on one of these Zoom calls and she was saying that um, this is what our parents went through with World War II. They all had to sacrifice and they all had to give up things because they were part of a larger effort. And that's what we have to do. We have kids at home complaining because they're not <clears throat> able to play sports or see, see their friends. So I just ask you and thank everybody because it seems to be working uh, in our state and I think in the, this county in particular. And we can talk a little bit more about that. So really terrific work on that. Um, first, um, the first thing that we always talk about, so we have a team that meets uh, every morning. And the first thing we talk about is um, we do a check-in to make sure our um, force is, it's called force protection, make sure that our first responders are healthy and safe and have the tools that they, they need to do the job. Um, we do that every morning. We check with police, fire, DPW, our town hall staff, our finance staff, uh, IT staff, everybody to make sure is everybody still, how are we doing in terms of who's being quarantined, who's, who's not. Um, right now, all of our first responders are, are in good shape. Uh, fire department, um, the uh, police department, they're doing things differently than they have in the past because they're observing the rules. So if there is a domestic violence response by the police department, or if there's a, um, a, a party just, you know, that they're visiting, they'll maintain distance from the interaction, which is different than they used to do. But they're, they're all taking precautions so that our first responders don't get infected. Um, so, and then the other thing, the other really high priority for us is our DPW employees, especially the water, and wastewater treatment plant. 
operators. They're critical to our infrastructure. Uh, the DPW has taken to um, staggering our shifts so that we might have a day shift and a night shift. So if one shift gets uh, infected, the other shift is still operational. So they're not all working the same shift. And that's, that's been really a positive thing for us as well. Uh, you'll, see, so you'll see DPW workers out working. Um, you won't see as many because we're breaking them up, but there's still our work. There's still work they have to do. Next week, they have um, a sewer pipe that they have to um, clean out, um, mostly because of flushable wipes. They're not flushable, um, and there's a term for it, wipes don't, what is it, uh, Brianna? Wipes clog pipes. Wipes clog pipes, so please don't, don't, don't clog, throw down your, um, the gloves or the wipes down the toilet. If they don't, if that doesn't disintegrate in water, it will clog the sewer lines, and that's become a, a big problem for us, and um, it becomes a, uh, just a challenge to fix all these things. We're flushing our, our sewer mains more frequently. So thank you for all that. Our town operations are, are doing well. Uh, there are certain things we have to do in town hall, like payroll and uh, things like that. So we're trying to keep everybody as socially distanced in town hall as possible and uh, moving forward on that. Um, you may have heard that uh, this weekend we closed all of the playground equipment uh, uh, and roped it off uh, both for the town and for the school playgrounds. This is because we could not adequately sanitize it on a regular basis. The parks, the, the space themselves are open and we hope that you'll be able to use that. But again, uh, in a uh, way where you're, you're maintaining social distance from each other. Um, you, uh, yesterday, the, it was yesterday, the governor extended the stay at home order till May 4th and we abide by that. If there are gatherings larger than 10 people, we would like you to let us know that. Um, and so, because we will have the police respond and start to educate people. Um, we want to limit the number of, of the, the, the level of gatherings that we have. Um, let's see. We've talked a lot about uh, continuity of operations. It's called COOP plans for all of our departments. Um, we have a new website that Brianna's been working on. It looks really sharp um, and it's called um, AmherstCOVID19.org. And on this website, we're working with the school department to put as much information on one website so it's easy for you to find anything that has to do with it. Um, so that's the way it looks. And it's still a work in progress, but it's going to have tons of information up to everything that's most up to date uh, in terms of where, where we are. And we are open to your suggestions and ask you for comments on how we can make it better for you. Um, four big areas that we're, we've spend a lot of time on, um, we think of them, I think of it as sort of our vulnerable communities. One is our local businesses and downtown, um, it's, it's it, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of sad to be down here because there's so many businesses that have just shuttered their, their doors and um, business, you know, the restaurants are doing takeout. So we're trying to support takeout businesses to keep those restaurants, keep their employees employed. It's really hard for the um, employees who you know, they, they're not getting their paycheck. Uh, many people work paycheck to paycheck and this has been really hard. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has a tip jar on their website. If you want to, if you, if you typically would tip every day, if you were buying a cup of coffee, you can go there and put, put, put some money in the tip jar. Um, so local businesses and the people who have been employed by our local businesses is, is, are struggling. Um, and so we're meeting tomorrow actually with the bid in the Chamber to talk more about some of the opportunities and um, options we have for them. Um, the second is our, our senior population, our elders. Um, we have a director of senior services has worked really hard to make sure that they are feeling uh, safe and connected. You know, we think about uh, social distancing is also social isolating. And so setting up our, uh, ways for people to connect with each other uh, have been working on that. Uh, food security is a big thing. Do people have enough food? And we're, we're um, I think it's been okay so far, but we're anticipating that that's going to become more of an issue. People have gotten their last paycheck, but then it becomes more of an issue. To, to address this on Monday, the director of uh, the Amherst Survival Center, Len, Le, Le Ben Ezra, will be at the town council meeting talking about how what, what, the, what the survival center is doing and then uh, how people can help with their, with their mission. And lastly is our homeless population. Uh, People um, experiencing homelessness are in a really desperate position because if they get diagnosed 
uh, with COVID or, or they have to go isolate, they get told at the hospital, you're not sick enough to be in the hospital, you should go home and isolate. They don't have a home. So we have been working super hard every day, um, seven days a week, quite frankly, to make sure that if that happens, we find a place where they can um, rest comfortably while they, they take on this, this disease. Um, it's hard to find a good place that's safe and uh, responsive to them. So I think I'm gonna stop there. And I think um, Mike is gonna talk a little bit about what the schools are up to. Good thing. So before I do, I just wanna um, really thank the town. Uh, we've, we always, uh, from the school's perspective, uh, have a great collaboration with the town of Amherst. And I think uh, that goes really smoothly when time is, times are good. Uh, when times are stressed or stressful or challenging, um, you know, those relationships can go one of two ways. And I just, uh, I want to, you know, share with the public that I feel very fortunate that our relationships only grown tighter and we have uh, conversations uh, nearly on a daily basis. Uh, there's plenty of days where it's multiple times uh, per day, whether it's Julie or Paul or, or someone else. And it's, um, it's been great. And we really feel fortunate to be collaborating with the town who wants to collaborate with the schools and sees it as a partnership. So, you know, thank you all, uh, Paul, Julie, uh, Brianna, for your partnership and working with us and having me here on this call. Um, going backwards before we go forward, just for folks who may not have, had, uh, may not have kids in the schools, uh, on Friday, March 13th, um, I made the decision to close schools for a couple of weeks. And uh, two days later, the governor closed all schools in Massachusetts. And since he made that initial closing, he's now extended it till uh, Monday, May 4th, um, which as you know, is uh, the day that the stay home order ends. So many of us have some questions about the stay home order ending and kids being on buses the next morning and question, you know, is that gonna play out? And, and the governor was very clear in his statement that students will come back no sooner than May 4th, not that they were going to come back on May 4th. So I think we'll see how the next couple of weeks goes as the town manager said, you know, we'll see where, where that, how those lines look and, and where we're situated, but we are, uh, we're, we're anticipating um, that we may go back then. It may also get extended by the governor or we may feel like we need to do it ourselves. Um, and so since March 13th, our schools have been closed and there's been, the focus has been really on three things. One's on communication, the second one on safety, and the third one on distance learning. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about communication. So we've sent about 15 or 16 communications since COVID. Uh, since this all started, we do have a website. Uh, oh, thank you. Awesome, Brianna. Um, and it has some of the basics, but also you could see if, if Brianna scrolls down, uh, dated, and, and we've been um, numbering all of our communications. Um, we have a couple number 15s because they went, all went home in the same day. That's what that is. Uh, we've provided an FAQ document as well as additional resources linking to both the town site, Bay State, um, uh, the CDC, uh, and information about our meals program, which I'll speak to a little bit. And we're constantly updating this site so that there's uh, a bit of a history so people can watch uh, the trend of what our communication has been and where it's headed. Uh, all of these are also shared on our social media networks, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I think there's one more I'm not even aware of because I guess I'm getting too old. But, um, you know, that those are different ways. And particularly for those who, families who don't get our emails, they don't have a child in the schools, it's another way where people can find out what's happening in the schools uh, pretty easily. Uh, one of the big things that we've found is, is sending videos um, of our principals in particular has been really helpful. So especially at the elementary level, our principals are sending multiple videos home to students a week. And the feedback that we're getting from families is outstanding that, that it really, in this time, and, and the town manager spoke about it before, we're, before where we're physically isolating, how do we stay socially connected? And the principal plays such a large role. You think about an elementary school, everyone knows who their principal is. And uh, we've got some principals doing some you know, special effects, some pets are involved, inside, outside, and, and but they're really uh, making a very routine um, connection with students and our staff members in general, just reaching out, teachers, paraeducators, uh, to families, all sorts of ways. Uh, you know, another fun one is that tomorrow there's uh, Fort River teachers um, came up with an idea to do a parade. So there'll be two, two different routes uh, going through the Fort River enrollment zone of teachers staying in their cars, one person per car, uh, but waving to all the students at a, at a physically distant way. Um, just so that, again, that social connection can be in place. And uh, I can't wait to see it. It's going to be really fun, even if it's raining. Uh, what kids are looking forward to seeing their teachers so much. And so being able to do that in a safe way has been great. And the town's been supporting us with that as well. So the second piece is really around safety. Um, 
So after schools closed on the 13th and even before that, we changed our cleaning mechanisms uh, and making sure our schools are sanitized. At this point, our schools are locked and closed and very few people are in them. So we're maintaining those, but it's gotten a little bit easier. The vast majority of staff members in our district are working remotely and those that aren't are working on staggered shifts so that um, we're reducing the number of people who are in any building at any given time. We've purchased new equipment like a fogger machine that can sanitize large areas or uh, a significant area like a school in a day. Um, and, and that's something that's becoming more relevant and more needed, um, not just in the short term, but we don't exactly know uh, how things will move in the future. And we wanna make sure we have the best equipment to keep our schools as safe as possible. And um, within two business days of the, oh, so when I think about safety, I also think, you know, town manager talked about food scarcity. And that, that's a safety issue uh, from our perspective as well. And so within two business days of the closure, we had 13 sites and meals being delivered. Uh, we know that for many families coming to a central site like a school is not necessarily um, a reasonable option. And we also don't really want um, lots of cars and lots of congregation in our, near our school sites for all the recommendations we have from CDC and the Department of Public Health. Um, so we have 13 sites in Amherst. We're now partnering with UMass on the, uh, about half the sites that started the second week. And to date, we've delivered over 5,000 meals um, to our families. And um, you know, we're starting a new program tomorrow on Friday where we're gonna double up the meals so that families have meals, not just for Friday, but um, you know, to help with the weekend as well. And we're looking to expand the program into the town of Pelham as well, which is another our partner district and partner town. Um, so we feel uh, very fortunate that our staff members have stepped, not just food service staff, not just transportation staff, but all staff members that were given the opportunity to volunteer. And our problem is we had too many volunteers for our sites. And that tells you a lot about the staff of the Amherst Regional Public Schools that they wanted to, um, even from a distance, see their students and feel like they were contributing to the food scarcity issue that's so real for many of our families. And, and sadly, only getting more real as the town manager suggested earlier. The last thing I'll speak to briefly, then we'll open up for questions, um, is distance education. Um, and uh, this is how, what supports are we providing both academically and in social emotionally for our students while they are not in the same physical location as our staff members. So following the state's guidance, the first two and a half weeks were focused on enrichment activities. Now many of our staff um, Sent, uh, have maintained regular communication with our, with our students in a whole variety of ways. Some of that's video conferencing, audio conferencing, uh, emails, using um, different apps and different tools. Um, at the primary grade levels, there's some ones that uh, are really neat that, you know, books get sent home, the videos of morning meeting that teachers uh, do every morning and they send that video home to keep that structure and that normalcy for students. Uh, we also had a college counselor uh, in the first week we were done do 23 college um, college counseling uh, meetings with parents and students um, for 11th grade students who are starting to think about college in a very real way. So, so we are trying to continue that work. Uh, we wanna, our, our kind of one of the hallmarks of the district is wanna make sure each student knows who to call if they're uh, not feeling great. And that's not about this situation, that's in general. And we maintain that with a really strong counseling team uh, who's very, very active in reaching out to students and families during this time. Uh, the state shifted the guidance for, uh, for what distance learning means last week. So this week over 150 teachers and paraeducators got together and they formulated drafts of plans or just went out to teachers a couple hours ago uh, to get more feedback and what we're calling distance learning 2.0, uh, which goes beyond enrichment activities and um, gets a little more into supporting students again, academically and socially, emotionally uh, because of the extension of the closure. And I thank the teachers and, and paraeducators did a fabulous job um, and that'll roll out next week uh, live once we receive more feedback from our entire faculty. Uh, a major, I, I keep saying it, but I, I do wanna stress that a major focus of these plans is not just the academic, uh, but that sense of connection that we know for, you know, for many, many students, I would argue all students, that sense of connection to schools, to both the peers, as well as the staff members in their schools is a huge part of their life. And it's very disorienting to not have that. And we're trying to find the best ways we can to simulate that. Part of that is, is the use of technology. And so, so far, all of our middle school, high school students have, uh, we have a one-to-one -one program, so they all have Chromebooks, which allows them to have that. Uh, but so far we've delivered, I think it's up to about 150 Chromebooks to elementary students. And by the end of next week, we'll be over 300 students that we've repurposed uh, and, get, and made sure that uh, elementary students had access to. Uh, one of our largest problems is Wi-Fi access. Not every student in the district has Wi-Fi access. We estimate about 95% of our students do, and that still leaves 5% that do not. So this week we've purchased about 95 mobile hotspots 
uh, and we're in the process of getting them configured and uh, which takes longer than I'd like, but uh, that's the nature of this, uh, this, this world and getting them out to families who don't have uh, Wi-Fi access. And uh, we're, uh, we're really excited to be able to expand that program. Um, and so that it, it gives access, not just for the academics, but so many of us are relying on this technology to stay in touch socially. Uh, you know, certainly we're more focused on the academics, but but really to be able to have these kind of conversations with family, with friends in different places, we want to make sure that social emotional access comes along with the academic access as well. Um, so we hope to have that up and running in two weeks, which will greatly close the digital divide in our district. Uh, so I'll close by just saying again, um, the partnership with community, with staff, with families and with the town has been critical. And I think it will continue to be critical as this situation unfolds over the next couple of weeks and months. Great, thank you very much, Mike, for that update on our schools and all the great things you guys are doing. Um, before I open up the queue for the questions, I just wanna point out for those of you joining via the Zoom app, if you'd like to ask a question, please click the Q&A um, button and type your question and only the host will see that question and we'll answer it um, in this session. So one of the first questions we have is, um, hopefully we can direct this to Julie, uh, can, if she can tell us how the testing for COVID-19 works, um, can we just call in and get one or what is the process? Yes, thank you for the question. So the way that testing works is that only people experiencing symptoms can be tested. First of all, the test does not work if people aren't symptomatic. That's a difficult thing, I think, for people to understand, but it takes the presence of symptoms, which indicates that there's enough of a viral load in the body that a test will actually um, be able to detect the disease. So the next piece of this is that there are still not enough test kits. The people who, get, who will get tested are those who are experiencing fairly moderate to severe symptoms. So a person's first step is to contact their primary care provider by telephone to talk with them and tell them how they're feeling. Their primary care provider then triages over the phone with them to figure out just exactly what their symptoms are and if they really do meet the criteria for how we're diagnosing COVID-19. Many people will just be told to stay home to recover and to stay in touch with their primary care provider if they start to have worsening symptoms because many, many people will not require hospitalization and will be able to recover at home. Tests are needing to be saved for those who are severely ill. And so some people will be asked to drive to their PCP's office be given a mask and met outside where they'll be tested. This won't happen for the majority of people at this time. Once someone is tested, that result comes back in one to two days. And then whether a person comes back tested positive or clinically diagnosed over the phone or by teleconference as having COVID-19, they'll be asked to isolate at home. If a person is tested, the results of those tests are sent directly from all labs to the state health department. The state health department then notifies the town where the individual lives. So in this case, if you're an Amherst resident, it, it notifies the Amherst health department confidentially via an electronic system. We then call someone up who has had a positive case, go over with them how they're feeling, their understanding of isolation and what that means, staying in the home, not sharing a bedroom or bed clothes or towels or dishes. And if, if they're able to have their own bathroom, if they're not able to have their own bathroom, then advising them to wipe down the bathroom with Clorox or Lysol after they use it and then returning to their own room. So not having contact with anyone until 72 hours after they have no fever and no other signs of cough or shortness of breath, and they have not taken any fever-reducing medications for 72 hours. 
At that point, they would call their doctor, review all this with them, and be released from isolation. Meanwhile, at that first call, the nurses in our office will be going over with the person who's tested positive any possible contacts they've had, whether in the household or outside in the community. We then immediately contact all of those people. This is what's known as contact tracing. We call them and review with them that they have come in contact with someone who tested positive and that they need to go into quarantine. Quarantine physically is the same as isolation. So you're not sharing a bedroom, you're not sharing towels or dishes, preferably not sharing a bathroom, but if you are cleaning that bathroom, the difference is that if you're quarantined, you're not sick, you're not experiencing symptoms. You are staying in quarantine for 14 days because that's the incubation period for the disease. And if during that time you start to develop some symptoms of COVID-19, a fever over 100 degrees, cough, shortness of breath, then you are to call your primary care provider so they can then triage with you to see if you have developed the disease. If at the end of 14 days, a person is feeling completely well, they leave quarantine, they are not sick, they are not contagious in any way, and quarantine ends. Great, thank you, Julie. So next question is, are there any confirmed cases in Amherst? And if so, how many? Yes, we have had some cases in Amherst. At this time, <clears throat> we are reporting the number of cases by county. So in Hampshire County today, we have 186 cases. The reason that we're not talking about the number of cases in our particular town is because we don't have many. And the, the advice from the Department of Public Health is that when we just have small numbers in a community, it's really important to not release those numbers because it could lead to compromising the privacy of the people who are experiencing the illness. And with communicable diseases, people do have the privacy to not have others being able to know that they're sick. Um, and that's why at this time, we're not announcing a particular number. The number is low. Thank you. So we have a question here about town operations. Um, they want to know what is happening with dog licenses at the moment. Paul, you're on mute, Paul. So, thank you. Um, well, first, thank you, Julie. It's, it's just uh, a side note that it's really terrific that our town has Julie Futterman and Jen Brown, who are both uh, registered nurses working in our health department at, during this critical time. They both have decades of experience in this area in particular, and it's just been fabulous because so many of our decisions are based on science and we need uh, science, scientists like nurses to uh, help us interpret what the information that we're reading, what we're receiving is all about. So about dog licenses. Um, so this, this uh, pandemic affects everybody in different ways. So we are processing dog licenses. We have 210 dog licenses that have been submitted so far uh, this year. They are being processed. Um, through the town clerk's office. We have a skeleton crew in the town clerk's office. They're rotating through uh, on, on, on shifts and we should have them all, all the ones that are in as of today, the 210, they should be out in the mail to you on by Wednesday. All right, uh, we have a follow up here um, for Julie. What should be done if you do not have a primary care physician? Who should you, who should you contact? <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to give you the number for um, Cooley, Cooley Dickinson's helpline. They are linking people with healthcare providers if you don't have one. It's a good idea to do that now um, so that you can get all set up in case you are sick. They're also helping people to be linked up with health insurance. So that number is seven days a week from 8.30 to 4.30. The number is 888-554-4234. So we do urge people to get a primary care provider, work on getting health insurance, 
no one should be going to an urgent care or an emergency room or a doctor's office if they're feeling sick. They should make a call first. Now, if you are experiencing severe symptoms of shortness of breath and a high fever, then you would call 911 and describe the symptoms that you're having if you don't have a primary care provider. And then you could be transferred to the hospital for assessment. But we're trying to avoid that because we don't want people leaving their homes and exposing others to the disease. We also want everyone to get care. So again, we urge you to get a healthcare provider now if you can. We will add this resource to our AmherstCOVID19.org website as well. One of uh, the questions just came in if we would do that, and we will. Okay, so we have a question here for, the, uh, for Mike Morris. Our questioner wants to know, can elementary school students have more structured Zoom type teaching, teachings given the school closure is so long? Yeah, so that's really uh, what I referenced earlier is the teachers are developing plans for distance learning 2.0, which will have much more um, opportunities for direct teaching. Uh, the guidance we received from the state is that we shouldn't be exploring new content, but taking existing content and going deeper uh, into it. So. Uh, you know, as we uh, move forward, there has been some examples of that, and there's a um, couple different ways to do it. One is um, live, like what we're doing right now. Another thing that maybe worked really well for families is to have tape lessons where teachers um, teach a lesson um, and send out the video, because we know for many families, it may be hard. It's not like the kids are getting dropped off of the bus and everyone's in school at nine o'clock for the lesson. So uh, I think what people will see is a mix of those two things moving forward. And again, that'll start up uh, on April 9th and then really in earnest uh, the week of April 13th, where there'll be uh, a really an increase from, again, from enrichment activities, which was the guidance when we first closed, uh, to having much more instruction and much more direct connection in those ways. So uh, I think I, I would say that we have a, a really, uh, I think both locally and statewide, there's an incredibly diverse uh, schools, di incredibly diverse schools of thought about it. There are people who don't want their children, especially elementary school children, on screens for long periods of time. And there's other folks who are very comfortable with that. And the way we're approaching is we're gonna offer those, um, that instruction and those skills to families and families can make the choice they think that's in the best interest of their child. But uh, I do wanna acknowledge that there are some real differences of opinion of families and we're trying to strike it down the middle where we're, we're offering the service uh, for students and families if they so choose to take it. There also will be other you know, non-electronic resources that go home. But I think for families, they would, uh, I would expect to see an increase uh, from as we move from enrichment to uh, the implementation of distance learning 2.0. Great, thank you. We have um, another follow-up question on con um, contact tracing, and this person wants to know how do you how do we conduct contact tracing for the co confirmed cases in Amherst? Thank you for the question. So. In Massachusetts, there are over 60 plus reportable communicable diseases. So for a couple of decades, we've been, the, the two of us who are working now have been tracking contacts for all of these diseases in various settings. COVID-19 is just another more complex disease because it is so contagious that there are so many contacts. So what we do, is we have a very deep interview with the case, the person who is ill. We talk with them about who they live with, what types of things they do, where they work, where they recreate. And then we go deeper talking with them about what they had been doing during the period of time that they were contagious. We then get names and phone numbers and addresses if we're able, not addresses, names and phone numbers if we're able to. If we're not able to get all that information, at least we get names and then we track those down. We then have confidential phone calls with all of those contacts. So anyone who has come in contact with a case receives a phone call from us. If it's someone who doesn't have a phone, because that does happen sometimes, then we send letters, we do door knocks, we do everything that we can to find a contact to let them know that they've come in contact with this transmissible disease. And because we have so much experience doing this with so many different types of communicable diseases, um, 
we have become quite adept at finding people and helping them to understand how to stay, how to protect themselves from getting sick and from spreading the disease. Great, thank you. We have, um, we have a question about, is there any advice if it's safe to ride in lifts and Ubers right now? That's a great question. Lyft and Uber all over the country have been very assertive in training their staff on how they should handle the interiors of their vehicles. So Lyft and Uber have been considered to be safe. One precaution that people can take is having Clorox or Lysol wipes with them, wiping the door handle um, on the inside and the outside when they enter a vehicle. And again, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers have, have been reached out to because they also want to be able to stay safe and healthy at the same time. So they are cleaning their vehicles and being taught about how this disease is transmitted. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a, a question here, or a statement rather. Um, things are very stressful in the house right now with everyone home. Is there any advice that you can give us? That's open to anybody to answer. I'll, I can jump in and start on that one if that's okay. Uh, I identify with that. Um, you know, uh, I've got young kids and, and uh, you know, I, I can identify that. And that's true to whether you have kids or not. But I think that's something I hear given my role quite a bit. And so uh, one thing I'll say, and I think everyone on the call will agree with us, and in physically distanced ways, spend time outside every single day. Even if it's raining, spend time every single day. Um, I think another thing that's really helped that I've read a lot about is uh, whatever the routine you want to have, try to maintain some routine in this in this new world where people are in their homes a lot, whether that's having a morning meeting of your family, uh, whatever your ritual you want to have, um, having adding some structure um, that that pushes you all to stop and 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 be with each other and not try to scramble between work and how to get everything done and cooking and you know for a lot of people who used to eat, uh, order out like this is a big challenge right where you can get your food and how to plan that out but really trying to preserve time um, I think another thing and I said this in the earlier call is um, make sure you're reaching out to people uh, in your networks uh, oftentimes people you don't uh, always reach out to if people are reaching out to you to check in make sure you're you're returning that favor. Uh, it's amazing how uh, I have two in my personal life, I have two uh, meetings like this, except um, not public, not recorded, uh, but with groups of people that um, I certainly could have connected with any number of times, once a group of college friends, once for family, and the number of people who want to jump in even for a 20 minute, 30 minute call, uh, given the situation is enormous. So trying to be the person who checks in on people who creates social capital, you know, with, within your group of friends that you are connecting or your group of family, uh, is hugely important. Uh, and also being kind to yourself. I think that's something that um, I'm noticing as everyone's trying to juggle uh, more hats than they're used to juggling uh, in a more confined space. Um, it may mean that you're not cleaning up as much as you'd like in your house. And, and that can be really stressful for people. I mean, those small things really matter. Um, so just making sure that you're, you're taking care of yourself, especially if you're a caretaker for whether it's children or parents or other family members, uh, that you're finding ways to, to give yourself a break uh, and give yourself time every day to acknowledge that. One, one thing that we're doing in a lot of my administrative meetings uh, with staff, uh, with my kind of leadership team, is just starting the day, every meeting we, we try uh, to dedicate time to start sharing something that's good that's happening, whether it's work-related or not work-related, um, but just sometimes acknowledging the good things that are happening in the midst of distress uh, and hearing other people's can be a really helpful thing as well. Sorry, I was long-winded, Paul and, and Julie and Brianna. You certainly can jump in, but it's something that, that we're, we're deeply concerned about because we know how stressful this is for, for children and families, um, and we experience it ourselves as well. So I'll just add a little piece to that. I think with our team, it's really about being forgiving of each other because we're making decisions every day. People are doing the best that they can. We might make a bad decision. Or we might adjust it the next day, but just giving people leeway to say, we, try, we recognize you're really, we have really strong people in our jobs, but they're making the best decision they can on each day. And then, you know, just being forgiving, like we get it, let's move on to the next issue. 
I think that's great. I, I'll just reiterate what Mike was saying that I think we are, we can look at it that we're so lucky that springtime is coming and this is when this is happening. We're not headed into winter. I recognize there are some people that love winter, but really I think all of us can relate to the blooming of the spring and how beautiful that is. And I think that um, helping our families and ourselves focus on what we can be grateful for now during these really tough times, I think it really um, helps to decrease our stress when we're thinking about others too. Great, thank you. Um, I think that is all we have for questions for now, all the time we have. Um, so I want to thank Paul, Mike, and Julie for their time today and to all of you for joining us. Uh, we will have more information on future events like this, so stay tuned. Again, if you need to follow up with us or we were unable to answer your question directly today, please email us at info at amherstma.gov or you can call the town manager's office at 413-259-3002. Thank you. Thanks, stay, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you.